just want to take you on a journey. I'm from Tanzania originally, and um, I have been through Silicon Valley and back to Africa in the last 15 years. So I'm going to take you on a journey as to how big data has influenced my career choices, and I've seen it everywhere where I've been, and even back to Africa. So actually, my first taste of business intelligence or big data was in aerospace. Um, as, a, as a kid in Nairobi at elementary school, I always used to um, get in trouble and we'd be put in the library and, and the only fun books to read were actually aerospace space books. They were half torn. And so I decided that I wanted to work in aerospace. So, uh, you know, sort of 10 years later, I, I found myself in an uh, aerospace organization, defense research in the UK, and I was basically working on telemetry systems, connecting them to desktop applications. So this is kind of very siloed systems, trying to get them to work in a manner that connects them to um, applications like Word, the documents where you can then write reports. This is typically to support the um, certification industry. You know, billion dollar flight test programs. I worked at a, a, a subdivision called the Empire Test Pilot School, which was founded in 1943. If you've seen Top Gun, then you know about test pilot schools. This is the first one ever. Uh, and their motto, as I put up there, is learn to test, test to learn which is actually something that since that, since that uh, job I, I started, I've always taken through to my career. I, I think the culture of BI, big, big data, needs to kind of understand this core principle that was actually um, you know, happening even back in 1943 when this uh, work started. So yeah, I mean, I looked back at this industry only yesterday and I found that it's actually worth $16 billion. And it's not, not, not even factoring in the drone market. So obviously the shift now from proprietary enterprise, BI, to sort of more open uh, big data across uh, industries on the consumer side is huge. So uh, that was kind of my first taste of data, and uh, I kind of have, you know, has anchored me a lot uh, through, through my journey. Um, then, so sort of four or five years later, I found myself in, uh, at Microsoft uh, after going to Silicon Valley, doing a Stanford MBA, and I took a job as a product manager. Uh, the idea is that you know, you know, aerospace projects were 20 years long, uh, and I didn't want to spend my whole life in one project, you know, a fighter jet that was going to take 20 years to you know, design, build, test, and, and commission, uh, deploy and commission. So um, going to Microsoft was where we released products every three years. Can you imagine? Back then it was, you know, at least in the 90s, it was, um, it was considered to be pretty fast to release a product like Office in, in three years. Whilst, uh, obviously, at the same time, we had this cloud disruption where things were being released almost monthly, daily, with the sort of uh, shift into the cloud uh, uh, sort of software as a service center market. But back then, BI was seen as, uh, Microsoft was seen as this thing that was, was too siloed in the CFO office or in the C-suite, and you needed to go more down to the information worker space. Um, the idea is that everyone had Excel, and I was a product manager for Excel, Access, and uh, Business Intelligence. Uh, a really interesting job <laughs> because you're managing Excel, which is the most, you know, the most popular software application in the world, which everyone uses for BI, but also Access, which people are using less and less, uh, and was getting disrupted by companies like Salesforce and the cloud. So I, I called it managing the yin and the yang because everyone loved Excel, people kind of hated Access, uh, but also uh, IT hated Access the most because you have these rogue you know, star employees and companies that would build these tracking applications on Access, and then there, would, you know, there was this worry about, you know, are they safe, are they secure, are they governed properly? So I, 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 I put up a slide there of a chart I drew back then uh, at a conference called USPRIG, the European Spreadsheet, Spreadsheet Risk in, in Interest Group, which is a, a group of folks in Europe who are concerned about the use of Excel on Access, um, you know, they were causing problems, you know, as far as, you know, having, you know, corrupt data in there or you having modelers who were making decisions that were very impactful in the organizations that were, you have to remember that this was also part of the, this was during the financial crisis time, right? So people were kind of wondering, you know, um, was business intelligence something that needed to be controlled and, and, and really sort of tightened down? So the, at that point, I think BI was taking off mainly because, um, people had sort of risks that they, they, they could see in how data was being used in the organizations and how they can be, get more of their organization. But governance was a real problem back then, and you know, I remember people kept asking us, um, uh, basically, why is there no version control in, in, in Excel as easy as it was, it was in Word? Um, being Excel, for instance, you know, I had to get up in the morning and deal with, say, Goldman Sachs asking for a million more rows in Excel, versus, say, a school teacher who'd call me and say, I can't use Excel for my, for my students, and I've heard of this thing called Open Office and Google Docs. Maybe I should start switching to that uh, for, for simpler. So kind of this gulf of the enterprise market taking off and wanting, to, wanting more power and shift to the cloud, as well as um, the consumer side wanting simple applications and visualizations. 
Um, fast forward again another five or so years, um, of 2010 really when it started, uh, I found myself doing venture capital in, in Silicon Valley, uh, left Microsoft and worked at a small venture capital firm, and we saw this massive shift uh, in the cost of launching a startup. Um, you know, back in 2000, it was a million dollars to launch a startup. You needed big proprietary databases, Oracle servers, et cetera, licenses from different organizations to get going. Right up in 2011, now you basically developers can start companies because you have Amazon Web Services, you have Facebook distribution platforms, and much more open, easy way to get started. And so this actually affected the industry I was in. Of course, at the time, we were like, yes, you know, big data is coming to the consumer side. Everyone can get access to it. But actually, the venture capitalists themselves are being disrupted by this very wave. Right, so one of our investors in Savannah Fund, um, which is a, a, a VC fund focused on Africa with 15 investments so far in five countries, is 500 startups. Um, they have now invested in 800 startups in four years um, in, globally. Uh, and so Dave McClure, who runs 500 startups, if you know of him, he calls this the money ball for startups. The idea is that because the cost is so low, you can actually now and we've seen the emergence of startup ecosystems around the world, whether it's Cape Town, Nairobi, um, uh, India, China, uh, it's actually uh, led to a creation of a new category of investors called micro VCs, which basically apply big data to startups. And one of the most exciting startups in Silicon Valley right now is a company called Mattermark, which allows you to track startups, you know, particularly combine it with companies like AngelList. Um, and the, this model of accelerators, Techstars, Y Combinator, you can now start to like, uh, get early signals on startups as a VC and make a lot of small bets across them and just look at the traction. And then the idea is that you follow on the winners. Um, so you know, the, you know, the promise here is that because of open access data, you can track a startup's employee count on, on LinkedIn. Uh, you can track its unique visitors from, you know, um, if, if they have a website or an app, you can track the app downloads on Google Play. Or, uh, or through other services for Apple. You can track um, the number of followers on Facebook. You can also track, um, you know, basically, uh, the funding rounds as well. So the fact that, for example, TechCrunch, which is a very well-known uh, tech um, uh, uh, magazine online, they had a crunch base of a database of startups, which they would track all the news and funding rounds. You could then see which startups were kind of moving and create your own scores around which ones, which ones are doing well that fit your criteria to invest. And so, um, interestingly enough, 500 startups was initially laughed at when they launched. They called it spray and pray. They were like, oh, they're going to lose all the investors' money. Uh, and it was actually quite bold at the time. But as of, I would say, this year, of these 800 plus startups they've invested in, um, they're actually returning money to investors now. Uh, but you still have a power law where you have a few, maybe 10, 20 startups to make up the billion dollar companies. But, but to get to those, they had to really invest across a wide swath of uh, of uh, industries and geographies. Um, so yeah, it's actually working this model and I'm applying it with Savannah Fund in Africa. Where 15 investments in two years is nowhere near the rate that 500 startups does. They do uh, almost 120 startups a year or more, but no one has really invested at the rate in the early stage startups uh, as Savannah Fund has done to, as, far as, my, as far as I know. And after two years, I can say that it is working. We're seeing you know, growth in startups that I, you know, for example, I invested in Nigeria a startup in Nigeria that I didn't even, I haven't, I haven't even been to Nigeria, right? And one big rule of venture capital investing is you should ne never invest in a country you've not been in. But because the, you know, the idea, I discovered it through the team, through LinkedIn, through a, a network online, it was easier to analyze that than traditional. And even though it was a high risk investment, actually ended up panning out to be one of the best ones we've actually done, right? So, you know, this money ball approach to startups is actually really, really kind of uh, the future as how you start and fund early stage startups. So now back to Africa, right? Uh, I've talked about my journey through you know, aerospace and Silicon Valley and now doing um, the venture capital, bringing that model to, to Africa sort of as a money ball approach. But what about actual stuff that I'm seeing in the startups I invest in? Actually, big, we see big data all across these startups, right? So being in Kenya, you may have heard of M-Pesa. M-Pesa is the sort of world's number one mobile money platform. I think three out of four mobile payments happen in Nairobi, again, Typically, Silicon Valley would be where you'd find this sort of thing, but actually, Africa and Kenya, where it was actually really growing. And PESA now does about 20 transactions per second, two and a half billion dollars a month of transactions, peer to peer and bill payments. Um, a third of the Kenyan GDP flows through M-Pesa. Um, and it's actually a proprietary closed network. It wasn't designed to, to do what it's doing now, it was, it was released in 2007. And as of today, it's really become one of the drivers of the Kenyan economy in formalizing it. But um, 
even despite the lack of, of, of API access um, uh, to M-Pesa, we're seeing some interesting startups come out of, out of building on top of M-Pesa. For example, uh, there's a company called Modi, which stands for Mobile Decisioning, which uh, seeks to use airtime data and M-Pesa to determine uh, credit risk to make airtime lending. So this company has done pretty well. I think it was incubated in, I, um, in Smart Camp IBM here in South Africa and has gone on to do really well across uh, working with different mobile operators to implement this, this kind of uh, way of uh, analyzing credit risk. Uh, we've also seen it t t going a step further. We've seen it being, uh, being used um, for energy asset leasing. So a company called M M Copa, which um, you know, is a solar company where just like how in the West or even here you can buy an iPhone on contract, you can start to um, lease or lend assets against th this sort of credit risk model as well. So we know that uh, in Africa there's more access to mobile technology than, than there is electricity. Uh, and so energy access, in the, particularly in ur semi-urban and rural, is really, really hard to come by. But they have mobile, mobile technology and they have M-Pesa, so why not be able to let... So I think you can, you can buy an M-Copa solar unit for about uh, $10 or maybe 100 Rand up front, when it's actually worth more like 1,000 a, a Rand, and you can pay it off with M-Pesa remotely. Uh, but there's such a credit risk up front using, these, these, uh, using big data. Um, but, and then also one of our investments... No, I'll, I'll talk about First Access, another interesting company in Tanzania where I'm from. Uh, first Access became the first company, uh, I think, in Sub-Saharan Africa to create a credit bureau that um, works off mobile networks. So they connected to all four mobile networks in Tanzania. I think it's Zantel, Vodacom, Airtel, and Tigo. And they actually uh, allow microfinance loan officers to uh, assess credit risk and they, and they charge them a dollar uh, for each. Um, all, all they have to do is ask for the person's number, and they can look up their airtime history and air, M-Pesa history or mobile payments history, and then, and then basically um, it gives a credit score, which they can then use to uh, make a decision on the lending. Um, one other area that I'm really passionate about is education. Obviously, we've seen the rise of Khan Academy, Coursera, and these companies obviously in the West have huge big data teams that analyze how students learn and help teachers be more effective. We're seeing this also in Africa. One of our investments in AIDS education does quizzes over mobile um, to elementary school students and uh, are able to then personalize that. They have about 60,000 subscribers in Kenya, and they're also using mobile networks to kind of reach those, um, those uh, uh, students. Of course, we know where we are now, there's a sort of interesting time ahead with the, you know, the rise of sort of, uh, sort of uh, deep learning, cognitive computing. Obviously, you probably some of you have heard of the Watson computer that by, by IBM, which is um, uh, allowing much easier pattern recognition. But I think you can't really have some of these technologies really reach scale unless you start to change how query is done with user interfaces. So the rise of things like Siri and iPhones or Cortana with Microsoft are making it easy for you to query and ask questions and get the right insights and answers. Um, so I think we're going to start seeing a lot of this, particularly as smartphones become cheaper in Africa. I think we've now reached about $34 for a smartphone. If you can imagine someone who maybe can't read in sub-Saharan Africa can use a smartphone using an interface like Siri or Cortana to ask a question and get an answer. So we could, I think we're going to see some huge innovations around maybe healthcare, where maybe a health worker in, say, Uganda, who is, you know, there's the lack of doctors there to, you know, to do... Um, uh, work in the medical sector, maybe the health worker can actually query using something like Siri or Cortana on a cheap smartphone to, to help them decide or be more informed about the actions they take as a, as a medical worker. Um, so, so just I want to end with the fact that what are the challenges for Africa in general uh, with this? Uh, I've talked a lot, a lot about mobile networks in Africa. I actually think that they are still not uh, open enough. Um, I recently learned that um, the UN and the G uh, global, uh, GSMA, the Global Standards Mobile Association, failed to get mobile operators in Sierra Leone and Liberia to release data to help healthcare data scientists track patterns of movement for Ebola, the Ebola virus. Because they were using old, stale data from like 1980s about how people travel in those countries. And the, the, for privacy and commercial reasons, mobile operators refused to give this data up, which would have really helped uh, track the flow of Ebola, uh, you know, um, just by analyzing. Uh, the data there. So I'm really worried about that. Obviously, we, 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 we're going to hear a lot about this today, about the lack of data scientists in Africa. We need to develop more of those. Um, but I do think we will start to see a lot of the top data scientists uh, in the world, whether it's from Silicon Valley or here, attack really good problems in Africa where they see an, a big impact. You know, my, 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 my call to action here is that we should not be spending our time using big data to 
get better selfie apps with Facebook or Instagram and Snapchat. We should be using it to solve real problems. And of course, affordable internet access. That's the other big thing. I have the graphic on the right there that shows that um, Facebook is a dark continent. So Facebook shows that Africa is still quite dark, but we're seeing companies like Facebook, Google invest in getting uh, more internet access, because I think this is also gonna be important to, to allow more open access to, uh, to, the, uh, to the masses in Africa. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you.